Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter March, the Executive Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences here at uh, Rutgers University. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first of a series of events for our new AI, uh, Critical AI Initiative. In a way, just the title School of Arts and Sciences suggests a divide within our academic community for the people working on discovering scientific principles and building new technologies are separated from those pursuing the humanities, for example. However, artificial intelligence is an exciting area of interchange between the arts and the sciences, where the principles and intellectual frameworks of the humanities are not just useful, but necessary critically to examine the growing impact of, of AI on us as individuals and on us as a society. The technological questions about data sources, algorithm design and training must be complemented by philosophical questions about social impact and the ethical complexity of AI applications. And it suggests the need for a human-centered approach to AI. I've been delighted to support this initiative and I wanna take this opportunity to applaud the many efforts of Lauren Goodlad and the fellow organizers from the Rutgers University Center for Cognitive Science and the Center for Cultural Analysis for creating this initiative. Finally, I'd like personally to welcome Meredith Whitaker from NYU and the AI Now Institute for our inaugural, inaugural event. But first, I believe Lauren's going to say a few words of introduction. Lauren? Lauren, you're muted. Okay. Thank you, Peter, and uh, welcome everyone to this exciting inaugural event um, for Rutgers. And we hope for all of us interested in bringing humanistic thinking and interdisciplinary critical methods into close collaboration with the brave new world of AI now evolving before us. I'm Lauren Goodlad, a professor of English and Comparative Literature here at Rutgers. And it's my honor to welcome you today and thank you for joining us. Critical AI began as a unique collaboration between two Rutgers Institutes, the Center for Cultural Analysis under the inspired leadership of my colleague, Colin Jaeger, and the Center for Cognitive Science headed by faculty director, John McGann and executive director, Sarah Pixley, both in psychology and formerly by Brian McLaughlin, a distinguished member of Rutgers' wonderful philosophy department. In addition to this fantastic executive team, I must give a special shout out to Jake Romano, our nimble grad student project director and exemplar of human intelligence at its most irreplaceable. From the start, our vision has been to create real interdisciplinary dialogue around research, teaching, and public awareness in the crucial terrain of those complex and rapidly developing technologies now emerging under the rubrics of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Our steering committee includes computer science chair Matthew Stone and director of the Center for Discrete Mathematics and Computer Science, David Pennock, both visionary researchers who have welcomed collaboration from across the disciplines and shared their critical thinking in return. Though I can't thank everyone by name today, I offer gratitude and kudos to every one of our brilliant steering committee and working group participants in the School of Communication and Information, the Law School, the Blaustein School of Public Planning, Mason Gross School of the Arts, and within the School of Arts and Sciences and the Departments of Anthropology, Art History, English, History, and Philosophy. On behalf of this team of expert collaborators, it's my pleasure also 
to welcome all of the speakers in the series who are with us today. Next week at 11 a.m., note the time, we'll be, we will be ho hosting the first of our Think Piece panels featuring presentations by an open discussion with a, a trio of great speakers. And rather than um, read a lot of names to you, I'm going to invite you to go to our website. If you have trouble finding it, you can follow at Critical AI on Twitter, or if all else fails, just email lauren.goodlad at rutgers.edu. Though it is my job now to introduce the official introducer, who is also my co-moderator for today, I cannot pass the opportunity to directly thank Meredith Whitaker for her generosity in joining us today. When we wrote to her a few months ago, I hardly dreamed that she would make our wishes come true by agreeing to kick off our embryonic venture. In addition to being a leading computer scientist, she is an inspiring activist and multifaceted public intellectual for our times. I can't think of anyone I am more eager to hear in these critical days. Without further ado, I turn over now to my distinguished colleague from DIMAX, David Pennock, the winner of two Test of Time Awards in 2020 for, for pioneering papers that have shaped the search experience as we know it. David joined us in January 2020 as DIMAX director, leaving Microsoft, where he was principal researcher and founding assistant director of Microsoft Research New York City, a leader in the economics and computation area of AI. He has served as chair of the ACM special interest group on the topic and co-founder and co-editor of the journal ACM Transactions on Economics and Computation. He is also absolutely delightful to work with. So I now turn over to his capable hands the task of introducing our keynote speaker. And thank you again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for that kind introduction of me. And I'm thrilled and honored to introduce today's speaker, Meredith Whitaker. Uh, as Lauren mentioned, when we were thinking of who could kick off this first keynote for Critical AI, um, Meredith was absolutely at the top of that list. And we're great, very grateful to have her here today and that she said yes. Um, Meredith is the co-founder of the AI Now Institute based at NYU. It's the central hub for interdisciplinary research on the social implications of artificial intelligence. I was actually a witness to its founding. Um, Meredith's co-founder was my coworker at Microsoft at the time. So it, it was kind of, it was cool to see that at least as a fly on the wall that uh, AI Now being created. And I went to the first um, AI Now symposium in 2016 and it really blew me away, uh, both in terms of the quality of ideas and the quality of speakers and the interesting concepts and topics but also the diversity of people and perspectives that, was on, that were on display. And it, it really showed what every conference should be. <clears throat> um, and we really have no excuse not to do it that way. Um, so if you wanna get up to speed on the topic of AI and ethics, look to the reports coming out of AI now, including the um, optional pre-reading for today on disability bias and AI. Um, these reports are in depth, they're insightful, extremely well-written and produced from diverse panels of experts. Uh, Meredith is currently the Mindaroo Research Professor at New York University. Prior to that, she worked at Google for over a decade. So she <clears throat> speaks of technology from deep experience. She founded Google's Open Research Group. She co-founded Google's MLab, which is the largest source of open data on internet performance. Uh, she also worked on privacy and security at Google. She, and as Lauren mentioned, she was a leading activist inside Google, pushing them to drop military contracts, pushing to improve worker conditions, pushing to organize labor and more. And she's also advised the White House, she's advised the FCC, she's advised New York City, the European Parliament, and she has many other honors and it's our honor today to host her. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Meredith uh, to begin her talk on AI and social control. Uh, thank you, Meredith. 
Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I want to thank the Critical AI Initiative team for inviting me to speak today. I'm really honored to be here and I look forward to after the talk to being in dialogue with you all and, and staying around for the Q&A. Um, I want to particularly thank Lauren Goodled, Sarah Pixley, David Pennock, Jacob Romano, and Peter March, and all the others who did the work of coordinating this talk and are doing the labor of moderating Q&A and otherwise creating this space for us all. Before I move forward, a couple of acknowledgements. First, I'm speaking from Brooklyn, New York in unceded Lenni Lenape territory. I want to honor that and I want to use it to call attention to data recently released from APM Research Lab showing that COVID is killing indigenous people in the US at twice the rate of white people. This was preventable and it exposes the continuity of racist settler colonial violence in the US which is still operating through what abolitionist scholar Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls organized abandonment. Second, we're closing in on a year of COVID and I'm very privileged. I have a job, I have a home, my heat is on and I don't have overwhelming duties of care that I'm left to manage without support or accommodation. But a lot of people aren't as lucky. And I want to acknowledge that producing knowledge work like this talk in ways that signal business as usual can serve to erase the inequities that the state and institutional mismanagement of COVID have exacerbated. These burdens fall on BIPOC, women and gender non-conforming scholars and knowledge workers. Indeed, December 2020 US job numbers show that Black, Black and Latinx women lost 100% of the jobs uh, that were lost during that time. This is something we need to actively resist in our institutions and in our own work by rejecting the pressure to get back to business as, as usual and rejecting the benchmarks and assessments that judge accomplishment and worth by standards that are impossible to meet for so many during this time. So with that, I'll get started. My talk today presents a snapshot of research and analysis that I've engaged on and off for the last four years, which thread my interest in the political economy driving AI and the ways that AI functions to enforce normative categories of acceptable and unacceptable, worthy and unworthy. In this, I am especially grateful to scholars from the field of disability scholar studies, with particular thanks to Mara Mills, Sarah Hendren, Cynthia Bennett, Meryl Alper, Joy Rankin, Alex Wong, Trey Ginsburg, Chauncey Fleet, and others whose work theorizes AI and computational technologies at the intersection of disability, asking fundamental questions about the politics and consequences of classification. Now, as a lens on these questions, I'm going to examine the entanglement between neuroscience, human enhancement, and AI, looking at the companies driving these technologies and the often wildly unsubstantiated claims they're making. My hope is that this narrow focus will help highlight AI's profoundly and inescapably, norm and inescapably normative functions and the power relationships that are guiding its application as a tool for social control. But first, how does AI relate to neuroscience and human enhancement? Well, to begin with, there's a historical link between neuroscience and AI, in which well-funded white men sought the key to consciousness in computational frameworks. The vestiges of this pursuit are still here in the slippery term artificial intelligence, and in the persistent, if unevidenced faith that someday, somehow, AI will become sentient. Indeed, it is this near religious conviction that has propelled some tech oligarchs to pursue human enhancement tech in the hope of yoking humans to sentient AI before it leaves us behind. Second, AI and neuroscience are linked because AI techniques and the infrastructures required for AI comprise the foundation on which modern neuroscience and many other human enhancement technologies increasingly depend. AI provides the set of tools for making sense of massive amounts of neural data. It's used to find correlative patterns in this data and to interpret them. And in doing so, it necessarily produces models of the normal human, from our physical ability to our propensity for illness to our mental state, et cetera. Now, a couple of years ago, I was struck during a conversation with a well-known neuroscientist. We were talking about data collection and measurement, and he mentioned an EEG measurement helmet used for collecting neurodata. 
Now the helmet is designed for people with large heads and doesn't work on some smaller headed people, which means that it works better overall for men than for women. Now, since the helmet costs $200,000, his lab only has one. And by relying on this one for data collection, his lab also subtly but meaningfully centers men as the norm, an unsurprising and persistent example of a familiar pattern, which raises a serious and familiar question. Who gets to decide what's normal? It is impossible not to see the high stakes here and impossible to ignore the immense damage that oppressive class classifications of normalcy have done to those who fall outside. Now, as we stated in our 2019 disability bias and AI report, which many of the scholars I listed above contributed to, quote, the concept of normal, as well as the tools and techniques for enforcing normalcy have historically constructed the disabled body and mind as deviant and problematic. So we need to ask, what standards of normal and ability are produced and enforced by specific AI systems? And what are the costs of being understood as an outlier? How might these systems contribute to enforcing and creating fixed categories that further marginalize those who don't fit or those who do? Now in grappling with these questions, we must also recognize that AI's normative lo logic is impossible to escape. As Yuta Trevoranis, Director, director of the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University put it, quote, when we process data to guide our decisions using standard data, standard data analysis, our decision, decisions will be determined by the middle, which is the norm and represents the majority. In other words, adding more data to an AI system doesn't address the issue. It simply reinforces the normative model at the core of a given system's calculations meaning that those who fall outside of this norm become increasingly remote outliers. So no amount of additional data can solve this problem. This is particularly important in the context of disability. As we stated in the report, quote, disability encompasses a vast and fluid number of physical and mental health conditions, which can come and go throughout a person's lifetime. Simply expanding a data set's parameters to include no categories in an attempt to account for disability won't work to ensure disabled people are represented. Indeed, the way in which disability resists fitting into neat arrangements points to bigger questions about how other identity categories, such as race, sexual orientation, and gender, are mistreated as essential fixed classification in the logics of AI systems and in much of the research examining AI and bias. Now let's turn to the AI of today. As many of you are likely aware, AI isn't new. The research field is over 60 years old. But in the last decade, it's newly everywhere. So a question always worth centering is, why are we hearing so much about it now? Or what changed in tech to make AI newly relevant? In answering this, we hit against the concentrated power of the tech industry and its singular role in narrating the story we tell about these technologies. The technological breakthroughs that propelled the current AI gold rush from deep face to AlphaGo to GPT-3 are all contingent on the vast power and resources of the current big tech business ecosystem. It's no accident that all of these came out of corporate environments linked to big tech companies. They could not exist without it. It's not coincidence that the recent AI boom began around the same time that we saw monopolistic consolidation of the tech industry in the early 2010s. Indeed, the AI techniques they're relying on are in many cases old, but until recent, recently, the infrastructure to commercialize and commodify them didn't exist. And there are only six or so companies in the Western context with the means to create AI at scale. These are companies that have three things simultaneously. First, they have vast computational power, proprietary chips and supercomputing clusters effectively unavailable to those outside. Second, they can afford to pay Steph Curry salaries to scarce and highly trained technical experts who develop machine learning models. And third, they have massive, massive amounts of data, the kind and quantity of data that is almost impossible to get without vast and pervasive market reach. And where they don't have data, they can pay to create, create it and label it. This may seem a bit surprising, given that there are many AI startups and university AI programs. Surely they also create AI? 
But if you scratch the surface, those startups and universities are almost all licensing infrastructure from Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and maybe IBM. And they're scrambling for data, which is extremely hard to come by in the quantities needed without a surveillance business model already scaled and in place. This is one of the reasons that elite computer science departments have become increasingly closer to big tech, relying on these companies for the funding and infrastructure needed to produce so-called state-of-the-art AI research. So now let's turn to neurotech. Given all of this, we should not be surprised at those looking to shake up the neurotech industry and bring neuro enhancements to market are some of the very same data hungry companies that already have the power and resources to make AI. Indeed, these companies are among the few positions to store, process, and interpret the necessary data, and importantly, to commercialize and monetize such technologies. We're looking at Facebook, Microsoft, and Elon Musk's Neuralink. In 2017, Facebook, the company that helped fuel the January 6th white supremacist coup attempt, boasted that it had a, a team of 60 engineers working to build a brain computer interface that promises to let you type with your mind. They put it this way, quote, we want to create a digital assistant that can literally listen to your thoughts anywhere and at any time and privately. Privately, you might ask? Of course, by privately, they mean without having to say anything out loud, not without giving Facebook the ability to store, interpret, and act on your neural data. The company is particularly enthusiastic about this technology in the context of aug augmented and virtual reality. Now, in summer 2019, Facebook updated the public, boasting that University of California, San Francisco scientists who are sponsored by Facebook through this initiative quote, set, set a new benchmark for decoding speech directly from brain activity. So the researchers used an AI model to correlate neural data with speech, testing it on experimental subjects whose brain data they collected and then interpreted using the model. If the subjects confirmed that indeed the model got it right, guessing the words they were thinking or saying, then the model's efficacy at mind reading was confirmed. Microsoft is also in the mix, or at least thinking about it. In 2018, the company published a patent titled Changing an Application State Using Neurological Data. If you wear some kind of fancy headband and presto, you can use your brain to close a browser tab. It's the same premise. And of course, there's Elon Musk's Neuralink, a company developing brain implants meant to be embedded in the skull, which dangle electrodes directly into the brain. One more step toward his dream of avoiding human or Elon obsolescence by connecting humans to computers. Indeed, he cites this as a key motivation, driven by the fear that humans' limited capacity will be no match for AI's supremacy. In explaining the necessity of brain-computer interfaces, he says, quote, on a species level, it's important to figure out how we coexist with advanced AI, achieving some AI symbiosis. And indeed, Neuralink promises to, quote, promises, quote, direct lag-free interactions between our brains and external devices. Now Musk, ever the showman, has already implanted some version of this device in a couple of pigs and a monkey. Commenting on Clubhouse recently, quote, one of the things we're trying to figure out is whether we can have the monkeys playing mind pong with each other. That would be pretty cool. But it goes beyond that. In a promotional video posted December 2020, Musk claimed that Neuralink will solve a host of what he calls problems, quote, the reality is that almost everyone, over time, will develop brain and spine problems. In the background of the video, we see an image with the words memory loss, hearing loss, blindness, paralysis, depression, anxiety, addiction, insomnia, brain damage. He continues, boasting that, quote, an implantable device can actually solve these problems. Here, Musk presents a vision of humanity in which disabled people are erased, fixed by being turned into a normative version of a non-disabled person. This is, quite literally, everything about us without us. And as disability activist and scholar Ellie Clare points out, in relation to deafness in this case, quote, many deaf people claim themselves not as disabled, but as a linguistic minority. They locate the trouble they experience not in their inability to hear, but in the non-deaf world's unwillingness to learn and use sign language. In other words, the deaf community doesn't universally welcome technologies that, quote, bring with them the non-deaf world's hope of eradicating both deafness as a medical condition and being deaf as an identity. 
Not everyone wants to be Elon's version of normal. Now, while the hype produced by these companies and their spokesmen is not grounded in scientific evidence and often borders on the absurd, absurd a close reading of it exposes a troubling worldview that paints humans as the problem and corporate tech as the solution. Neuralink president Max Hodak builds on Musk's AI human symbiosis fantasy, positioning Neuralink as the one weird trick that would transform people into some superhuman species. In a recent Twitter poll, he asked in relation to Neuralink's potential capabilities, quote, what do you think would have the largest impact on you? One, eidetic or photographic memory. Two, ideal attentional control. Three, ideal emotional control. Or four, control over the rate of time. Here we see a familiar framing gone one step further. The medical model of disability, which as scholars Sarah Hendren and Mara Mills point out, quote, views disability as an impairment, illness, or disorder lodged within the individual, is applied to the sum total of our sordid, imperfect humanity, positioning our mortality as a problem to be solved. Indeed, in this familiar neoliberal frame, social issues are painted as individual failings and responsibilities. It is we who are broken and in need of fixing. Pay no attention to the systems that demand perfect attention, brutal emotional regulation, or memory recall, incapable of forgetting trauma and distress. And it is Neuralink, Facebook, and other large firms that are offering to commodify this fix, and in doing so, to create the benchmarks against which our humanity would be measured. Now let's turn again to the political economy of the tech industry. Because commercializing something like Neuralink doesn't just happen. It requires, as we said, a lot of centralized infrastructure. And indeed, if you dig a bit deeper, you'll see that the Neuralink job ads are looking for infrastructure folks able to build a quote, end-to-end -end development storage and compute pipeline able to scale to petabytes of data and hundreds of developers across multiple clouds. Translation, your neural data measured via the embedded brain chip connected to an app on your phone, which is real, um, will be sent to a neural link server infrastructure, where this data will be stored, interpreted, processed, and almost certainly used to train and calibrate the next generation of brain models, which Neuralink relies on to interpret your thoughts, abilities, and physical well-being in the first place. Now, if current law and practice applies, this data and the models it trains will also be owned by Neuralink, who may or may not be willing to fight a national security letter requesting your thought log, who may or may not be willing to sell this data to the insurance industry, to prospective employers, or to sundry other paying customers. Now we can zoom out from, the, from neural tech to see this pattern in the role of industrial AI products throughout our lives more generally. AI or computational technologies marketed as AI and automated decision, tech, decision systems are being used to determine who gets access to resources and opportunities across an endless and now familiar list of core domains from education to criminal justice to the healthcare industry, to real estate and rentals, to worker surveillance and assessment, and on and on. And again and again, we see these technologies replica replicating, amplifying, and entrenching familiar racialized, gendered, and ableist patterns of inequality under the guise of computational sophistication. Now, importantly, the ways in which these technologies entrench inequality goes beyond the sad litany of AI systems and their predictable biases that fail to hear higher pitched voices, fail to see darker skinned people, and that otherwise reproduce historical patterns of racist, sexist, and ableist discrimination in their technical functionalities and failings. This also means fixing these biases, assuming this were possible, would not make AI a tool for good. We need to look to the power structures and profit incentives that dictate which systems are developed and how, how they're used and by whom. Whatever the marketing claims, these systems are being produced by companies whose primary incentives are profit and growth. And they're being licensed, licensed to businesses and institutions to facilitate means testing, surveillance, austerity, and other forms of social control. In other words, the users of these systems are not the people profiled and assessed by them, nor are the objective functions of these systems that are baked in calibrated to serve these subject populations needs. So we need to situate Neuralink and its ilk within this landscape and to seriously consider the risk of a future in which a handful of private companies have a claim, whether real or not, to a map of our lives, 
to ourselves and, to and of how we respond and feel at any given moment, where these companies driven by capitalist incentives could be positioned to interpret our thoughts, psyches, and bodies with more authority than us. We have only to go back to the 1960s to look at the political abuse of psychiatry when, as Jonathan Metzl has documented, changes to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, led to the increased diagnosis of Black civil rights leaders as schizophrenic, based largely on pathologizing activism. Or to a time before 1973, when the DSM included homosexuality, quote, among its listed mental disorders. Or before late 2012, when it included being trans. Now, I want to be extremely clear. I do not see any evidence that such brain reading technologies are really possible or that such claims would be valid. I would look to the work of Luke Stark and others who've documented the fundamental limitations of the current crop of AI systems that claim to read people's emotions, character, and capabilities for more on this. However, these technologies don't have to work as advertised to work as intended. And in reading the hype, we get a picture of the future these companies are aiming to create. So what do we do? First, we need to acknowledge that it's generally more profitable to shore up the status quo and serve the interests of those with power and money than it is to dismantle these structures in the name of equity and a livable future. History shows that those with power rarely relinquish it without pressure. What's frightening about AI isn't terminators and super intelligent machines. It's the way AI works to centralize knowledge and power in the hands of those who already have it and further disempower those who don't. So to remedy the harms that AI enables and to reject its narrow and harmful models of normal, we need to confront this power. And power doesn't move based solely on force of arguments. Throughout history, it's clear that social movements and organized workers in particular have a central role to play in shaping structural change in service of justice. This is why after years at Google, spent researching and writing about tech's social consequences, often calling out problems with the company and its tech, I joined with my colleagues and I began labor organizing. Because while I had a seat at the table, I had no real decision-making power. I was a dissent court jester. I was enabling Google to claim to have heard all sides of the debate in the process reaching a thoughtful decision a decision that unfailingly prioritized expanding revenue and growth irrespective of the consequences. And organizing works. Organized Amazon workers pushed their company to make significant climate commitments. At Google, we forced the company to cancel contracts with the Department of Defense to improve its benefits for, for precarious contract workers, to end forced arbitration, and to scuttle a censored search product, among other things. And only the other day, the new Google union pushed the company to reinstate a colleague who'd been pushed out for speaking openly about their compensation. Indeed, the movement to unionize tech and formalize organized resistance as a common sense part of tech work is heartening. It's especially heartening to see organized workers adopt militant social justice forms of unionizing and collective action, which harken back to the fierce labor movements of the 1930s in the US. These workers are demanding not simply better working conditions, but control over their work and workplaces. This is something my colleague Nantina Bagansos and I wrote about recently, and it is, in my view, one of the most powerful levers for structural change available to us. Critical scholars of AI in the tech industry also have a major role to play in supporting and participating in these movements, in dissecting the hype and collaboratively writing counter narratives that expose the contradictions inherent in the tech industry and its products. This work is especially urgent given the obscurity and complexity of these systems and the means by which marketing and, and hype have so forcefully shaped public understanding. So my hope for building a future that can contest the power vested in the AI industry and, kind, and counter its shallow, shiny narratives sees organized workers, communities, and engaged researchers working together to not only take control of these technical infrastructures, but to architect their transformation building in their place systems of care, justice, and well-being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith.
Thank you. Uh, so now uh, Lauren and I will co-moderate a discussion. Uh, Lauren, do you want to give in, um, instructions? I believe sure. that if anyone you, can uh, enter into the Q&A, correct? Yes. Um, if you uh, look at the disabled chat function, you'll see the instructions are written there. We ask you to please use the Q&A function, not the hand raise, not chat, for your questions. You won't see your question until it's answered. And then we'll be, David and I will take turns and we will read your question. Once your question has been answered, you will be able to see it. And so we ask you that you please be uh, patient with us. I believe there is a question now. And if not, um, I can certainly open up the questioning. So why don't I do that? Um, Merida, thank you for that wonderful talk. I, um, I'm really struck by the, um, the way that there almost seems to be a, a dovetailing between outlandish claims about what AI either can do or will soon be doing and the more um, mundane but scary in a different way question of just um, fueling the surveillance economy, concentrating more power in the hands of a few people. And it, it almost seems to me as though it's impossible that these folks actually had a strategy. Let's pretend we're building mind reading and robot takeover, but what we'll actually do is increase our stock portfolio by doing some fairly, um, you know, data collecting mundane activities that are extremely lucrative for us. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you have anything to say, if you agree with me that there is a kind of an almost like accidental nature to the way these things work synergistically. If you have anything to say about the culture that um, you know, sort of foments this idea that certain types of scientists are gonna revolutionize everything in a way reminiscent of the books they read when they were teenagers. Yeah, I mean, I think I like your framing of this question and I, I certainly don't wanna paint a picture of a sort of 12 layer chess conspiracy theory here. But I think, you know, to understand these, you know, these formations, part of what we need to do is look at, you know, like what are the unspoken rules that go unquestioned, right? Like what gets funding and what doesn't, right? What, you know, like you can't perturb the sort of, you know, revenue goals of a company that's off the table, but within this small narrow window you're given, you can sort of shuffle things around and, and you know, do what you can. So I think we need to look, you know, there's sort of an objective function that is set within these companies that incentivize, you know, technologies that, that meet those demands. And, you know, within that we make one claim or another. Um, on the sort of sci-fi fantasy, you know, I can't, you know, I, I can't speak to like, you know, all of that history, but I can say that I think one of the, you know, one of the ways in which we've been kind of, um, I think late to a, a kind of meaningful critical pushback on tech um, is this sort of lone male genius myth, right? That dematerialized tech, it was sort of, it conflated the idea that sort of, you know, um, kind of profits for the tech companies or, or, you know, products produced by these companies were synonymous with scientific progress. And that, you know, what was happening was there was just sort of like great men with ideas in garages and those ideas sort of, you know, spread in some dematerialized fashion to, you know, create the internet or what have you. And it really, you know, that, that narrative that sort of centering these hero stories, I think erased sort of the, you know, one, the tremendous amount of labor, often very precarious labor that is required to create these systems and the sort of material concentration of powers that were happening below the systems, right? They're like data centers, right? There are, you know, infrastructures that are required to collect that data. There's a lot of, you know, extremely expensive and complex, um, you know, infrastructure that was sort of built up under the guise of that myth. 
So I think, you know, I, again, like I'm not, I don't think you need a conspiracy to see like there are certain incentives that are sort of driving things in certain directions. Um, and that those narratives played kind of a key role. It's almost a, a distraction from how you know, the political economy of tech was actually working below the surface. Yes, thank you. David? Uh, great, yeah, we, we are actually getting a lot of questions. We have 23 questions, um, and, but I, I just wanna ask one question of my own and then we'll start picking from these questions. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting that you said, um, you know, in some way it's the centralization that's the problem. It's not necessarily the technology that's the problem, but this centralized power and control of technology. And it's kind of ironic that, you know, when the internet was founded, it was this idea of like very decentralized, anyone can get uh, on, anyone can publish. Um, and it, we thought, you know, this would be wonderful for disrupting um, dictatorships, et cetera. And it, now it seems like it has not come around that way, but there are other things like, do you see any solutions? Like the Tim Berners-Lee has this concept of, you know, you hold on to your own data and you sell it uh, if you want to, or, or blockchain, I guess, is a truly, truly distributed technology that I don't know how that could be centralized. So do you see any solution to this, um, the way things have evolved? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see one solution, right? And one of the things, you know, we have to keep in mind is like who, you know, even back in the olden days of the sort of like, you know, the internet as a DARPA project and then the NSF net as sort of an accessible research infrastructure, you know, there were still people who couldn't access that, right? There were still barriers to entry. There were still costs involved. So I think, you know, if you look at, you know, blockchain is decentralized, but the carbon footprint of sort of Bitcoin is extremely high, right? And you see it already, you know, you have the, the Winklevoss twins and others who, because they have the capital have already sort of cornered the market in a certain way um, due to their access to computational infrastructure. So I think like, again, I'm kind of a base materialist on this. I think we could decentralize this in certain ways, but that would, you know, we're talking about a radical change in the way the tech industry works and the incentives governing it. And I think, you know, beyond that, which would mean, you know, perturbing the sort of technocratic capitalism as it works today in some pretty serious ways. I think we also have to look at the logics of these systems. Like there's still the question of even if they're decentralized and everyone can build their own AI, like what data are they building it on? Whose gaze does that data represent? And who is the sort of subject of that gaze? Who gets to use it and who is it used on? And so I, you know, I still would want to like pick apart these AI for good narratives and, and you know, just ask like who gets to define good there and are there, you know, are the problems they're posited to solve or the situations they're posited to improve, um, you know, are, are, are those things that like need AI as a solution or are we looking at structural problems that could be addressed otherwise? So um, I actually see three questions uh, toward the top that work very well together. Um, Andrea Kay is asking, uh, is saying, I appreciate your thoughtful position on unionization as an antidote to the relative powerlessness of positions in opposition to the dominant company view. But how do we shift the balance on small startups uh, at the forefront of AI. And Vivek Singh asks, in addition to saying, thanks for the amazing talk, what do you advise PhD students thinking of building a career in socially conscious AI to do? And if you can possibly triangulate that with Rachel Saunders' question of where data feminism fits in with your vision, you would be answering three questions at once. If not, I'll, I'll any of them. I mean, I wish people were here so we could talk it out because I would really, you know, first I would love to understand Rachel's um, kind of definition of data feminism, right? Um, and, you know, how, you know, what are methodologies for creating data through care work, through sort of recognition of difference, and how can that be done um, in ways that I think perturb the kind of extractive construct that has shaped a lot of what we call data today. So I think, you know, I, I would want to talk more about that and sort of poke into that question, but like certainly like 
feminism is core to my praxis, right? Like to the lenses that I apply and think with. Um, and I think, you know, we just need to be careful again about the power dynamics, you know, who is, who is the subject of data and who has the power to shape that data. Um, and I will say part of my experience with sort of building large scale measurement infrastructures was recognizing like how much power was vested in the people shaping that data and how naming the data and sort of naming you know, data as a, a robust reflection of a certain type of reality was sort of, you know, it was moving policy. It was, you know, moving kind of the public understanding. It was creating narratives. So there's there's a lot there that I would want to unpack. Um, and maybe there's a future in which we're all in person and can like have these conversations in more depth. But thank you for that question, Lauren. Um, and then on Andrea's question, I'm, I'm understanding to mean like, how do you level the playing field for startups? And I think that, you know, again, that's a question that gets to like, what, what are we talking about when we talk about AI? Because it, there isn't, you know, we could, we could sort of regulate kind of core, um, core computational infrastructures and data infrastructures as utilities. And there is, you know, in the National Defense Authorization Act, there's sort of a provision for a public cloud. Um, but that public cloud is still gonna run on Google or Microsoft or Amazon, right? Like no one else has those infrastructures. And so we have to, you know, we could say like, okay, all startups get some portion of that. But, um, you know, I think we'd still need to consider that, like, you know, consider ultimately like who is creating those infrastructures and do we want, you know, are we redistributing power through that sort of level playing field, so-called level playing field, or are we just carving up a starfish that's kind of kind of grow back uh, into many star starfish? And I think that's, that's a, that's a more difficult question. Um, but I, and I hope that answers what you meant. Um, and then on what should PhD students, you know, I, I you know, do to to build a career in socially conscious AI. Um, I mean, pay attention to this stuff. Like, you know, talk to folks who come from different disciplines, especially if what you're doing is developing AI for you know a specific domain, say medicine or education. Like, be in touch with the teachers unions, right? Be in touch with the nurses unions. Like, understand like the ground truth and where the hype and the claims and the sort of benevolent intentions that are often used, you know, to you know kind of get the NSF grant break down on the ground, right? Uh, and I think that's you know that's the practice there. Um, and to you know, be willing to organize and call those out when you do have privilege and safety in these positions. You know, it's I, I want to you know, not everyone has that, so that's going to be a, an individual choice. But I think being really attentive to those contradictions and the way that like, you know, the ben benevolent intentions used to sort of get funding and you know, and and support for these technologies are often left by the wayside pretty quickly um, once they are you know, uh, in line for commercialization. I hope that answers that. Great. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, read a couple questions uh, that maybe you could, that kind of relate to each other. Um, Andra Kie, Kie, I think um, she said, um, do you believe that developing independent ethical review boards are a valid and actionable course of action? So like while fa Facebook has their uh, review board for content moderation, that they're now evaluating whether to bring Trump back. Um, is that is this one route? I think another person asks about regulation. Paul Tolak, um, what do you see as the future of ethical AI regulation? Will it continue to self-regulate by corporate stakeholders? And or will we see government and other democratic bodies make some successful attempts at such? What will it look like? Um, and I think, you know. Uh, you know, tech has done a lot of amazing and great things, you know, without, you know, so like, how can we take away some of the bad things, but, um, but, you know, in a way where we can still have innovations? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think regulation is absolutely necessary. Um, but I think it's, you know, again, I would like contest the notion that Facebook is like, that good, right? Like I want, I want a capacious enough regulatory conversation that we can ask the question, do we need Facebook? And if we answer it, no, we don't have to have Facebook, right? Like I, I, I want the regulatory vision to be um, really broad and to sort of, again, like center human thriving 
Um, and, and I, you know, I think the Facebook oversight board appears at this point to be primarily a PR exercise. Um, it's not, you know, they don't seem to have teeth. And I think that's when you talk about ethical review boards, like what are the accountability functions? Like who, you know, who's liable if a review board finds a thing unethical, right? And I can name, you know, I have a whole litany of examples of like, you know, things that Google did after they floated their AI principles that like directly violated the AI principles. And, you know, I don't like, I haven't seen anyone lose a job over that. Although like a number of the organizers who were protesting it did, right? So I, you know, like, I think again, we have to, we have to be like, do these, do these mechanisms have teeth or are they, you know, perhaps worse than nothing insofar as they're serving as a, a kind of an illusion of a sufficient regulatory, um, regulatory, um, um, mechanism when in fact they don't have any power. And I think on the, on the regulation front, um, like, again, yes, we have like some of the antitrust proposals that we're seeing are really heartening. I think, again, I'm, I'm more interested in those that redistribute power to workers and, and communities than those that um, simply divide up companies, you know, based on their sort of market, um, market domains. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know, um, I, you know, power makes laws, laws don't make power. So I think we also have to be pushing for, you know, the the types of regulation that we want. And we can't just leave it in the hands of an administration that has way, 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 way more contact every day with sort of lobbyists and Eric Schmidt and whoever than they do with the folks who are gonna be harmed by this. So that, you know, we do in the, in, you know, historically we've seen sort of social movements, um, you know, at the helm of pushing for sort of justice oriented regulation. I don't think that's gonna to change today. Great. So, um... We have our first question from one of our uh, other presenters in the series, Katina Michael from Arizona State. Not sure if you two know each other. Um, she thanks you. What are some of the strategies we should be employing against the infrastructural stealth of neural link type organizations? The infrastructural stealth? Like, um, I'm not, I, I guess I'm not sure I understand the term infrastructural stealth. Katina, would you like to um, follow up on that? And I'll, I'll scroll down and make sure that I get that. I'm wondering if, um, if, if perhaps what's meant by it has to do with like a sort of an engineering approach, because I, I, I know that that is what um, Katina advises uh, policy in engineering, if I'm if I'm getting that right, but why don't we give her a chance to clarify? And then we have two questions that also work very well together. I'm scrolling down to uh, Lydia Sloan at 12:38 and Liza Loop at 12:38. Um, Lydia asks the ways you describe the mindset of AI in solving people brings to mind a eugenic worldview. <coughs> Would it be fair to describe it? as inherently eugenic. And then in, in a way that I think is complementary, uh, Liza Loop asks, um, since we're different, would we be better served dropping the term disability and substituting diffability? Difference is both more broadly distributed and less value laden than disability. Well, I'll start with that second one. And I think in using the term disability, I'm following disability, scholars and activists. And you know, so I, you know, I, I'm just not sure people would understand what I meant if I used disability. And I do think, you know, we could, we could go back to the history of the sort of way in which ability and disability were defined, right? Like the, you know, the, these are kind of social constructs, but they're social constructs with a lot of power and a lot of force that shape people's lives and experience. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I'm not sure that would meaningfully resonate with those histories or, or sort of censor them. Um, but I, you know, I understand that the, I understand the motivation. So yeah, um, in it, describing AI as it currently exists is inherently eugenic. I think a lot of the ways in which it's being used are certainly um, inherent, you know, inherently eugenic. I think, you know, you're looking at the AI algorithms that are determining who gets 
vaccines, et cetera. There's, you know, there are, there's a lot of kind of eugenics logic baked into some of these sort of means testing applications. Um, but I need to sit with it for a second to think about it as inherently eugenic. It does, you know, AI and, and the statistical techniques that undergird a lot of data analysis methods like have a very, you know, close historical link with eugenics and, and physiognomy. Um, and, you know, I'd look back to Galton on that, right? So like there is, you know, they are entwined and there's been a, a kind of uncomfortably close history there. Um, but I don't, inherently, I guess is what I'm getting hung up on because I'm like a pedant and I'm like, I'm not sure all AI is inherently eugenic, but I do think it lends itself for that type of, um, that type of, you know, I, you know, classificatory violence for lack of a, a better word. Oh, great. So I'll read you Nikita and then just question. Uh, it, it's kind of back to what the VEX question was. Uh, she says, uh, uh, I'm a grad student working in L NLP, um, natural language processing. I care deeply about how AI tech reinforces status quo power structures and can be used to further undermine labor rights. What kind of work and organizing would you recommend for someone early in their career? How do you think we can work on building a future for this field that is predicated on mutual care? I love that question. Thank you. Um, well, I think one thing that people, you know, just even the, the like rare knowledge you have as somebody who understands and has studied NLP, um, I think there is just a, a, a role for demystifying, right? For, you know, being able to say and, and describe the limitations of these systems. Um, because a lot of times, you know, again, like my observation and my, my research has sort of, you know, confirmed that you know, a lot of what we know about these technologies, because they are, you know, hidden behind veils of corporate secrecy, because not very many people have had sort of access and privilege to the kind of elite computer science training that would allow us to understand these technologies sort of deeply, a lot of them have been kind of mystified by the types of marketing claims that I went over in my talk. So even being able to sort of stand up in, you know, in kind of local testimonies at your, you know, at the municipal level, you know, and you know, write op-eds kind of contest some of the claims that are being made. Um, I would look to the work of um, Tanit Gebru and Emily Bender and Meg Mitchell and, and others recently, there was, you know, it was kind of the paper that, um, that, uh, Google retaliated against uh, Timnit on, you know, uh, kind of the, the retaliation against Timnit was predicated on, on this paper and, and some other things. Um, in any event, the paper was looking at sort of the harms of large scale language models and some of the, you know, the, the carbon intensive process of training them and also the, um, the biases that can be embedded in them. So I think there's work for people who understand NLP to also expose those and again, speak to the limitations. Um, and then on, you know, labor organizing and other kind of pushback, I think it's, you know, I always go back to the sort of IWW slogan of dig where you stand. Like, you know, who is in your community, you know, talk to the folks in your lab, talk to the folks um, in your local environment. If there's a tech workers coalition chapter near you, maybe, you know, sign up for a meeting, but there's always something to do. Right. And I will say like, it starts small and you can feel like it's just, like a little experiment, right? Like, you know, when we were starting, it was just some people meeting and being like, let's try this, right? But it doesn't take that many people to do something. Um, so there's, you know, there's always work and there's like, you can start your own thing. You can join with your colleagues. You can figure out what concerns you. You can, you know, look around. Are they replacing your street lamps with like surveillance cameras, right? Like there, you know, there's a lot always going on and specifically folks with computer science training who can speak with authority in these spaces uh, can, can kind of, do some really powerful work in pushing back. Right. So at both ends of the question that you just answered, at the um, less specialist end, Marianne Sweeney asks, how can non-computer scientists effectively contribute to the monitoring of AI applications? And then at the more specialist end, Cecilia Ricca asks, um, if you could elaborate a little more, especially given your experience with Google on what you know about how big tech is influencing academic research institutions that are working on AI. Cool, so I'll take the, 
the first one first, then, you know, what can non-experts do? And I think actually, like, this is like a, an important point because I think a lot of, like, c people with computer science knowledge oftentimes have no idea how these systems are used and what their impacts are, right? It, at Google, my observation was like a lot of times the marketing inside the company to like tell the engineers that what they were doing was very, very good was just as strong as it was outside the company. And then, you know, whatever the model they built or whatever, you know, the, the schema they were developed, whatever it was, would then be, you know, it, would, it was executives and salespeople who were making the decisions on how it was used. And that was like, you know, there was a pretty clear divide there um, in which, you know, you don't know who's licensing cloud infrastructure. You don't know who's licensing the sort of cloud AI models. You don't know, you know, you know where, you know, there, there were people working on Maven, which was a Pentagon contractor, people working on Dragonfly, which was a, a version of um, Google search that was um, built to allow arbitrary Chinese government censorship. There are people working on that who that didn't know that's what they were contributing to. So I want to be clear, like expertise in computer science does not mean you have the full picture of these implications. And oftentimes it's folks who sort of sense a shift on the ground, right? Immigrant communities who, you know, suddenly ICE is showing up at their kid's school or their friend's house in ways that signal like a lot more knowledge than, you know, ICE had previously operated on. And that sort of leading people to recognize the role of Palantir and these data aggregators and these, you know, kind of data data services Palantir and Amazon um, in sort of facilitating that, right? So I would, you know, I, I think there are always places for people who don't have that expertise to actually contribute extremely meaningful expertise on the lived conditions of these systems. Um, you know, lawyers can like write FOIAs. You can, you know, um, I think you know, work on sort of discovering where these systems are being used in, in your local communities. Um, but it's not, this is, you know, this is something that actually like requires folks with a lot of different domain expertise. And it, it, it requires like centering the expertise of the, the folks who are living under these regimes, um, because that's not something you know inside these tech companies. Um, and then I'm sorry, the second question was. Um, About big tech and how yeah. they're influencing academic research. Yeah, well, I mean, I think like this is not new, new, right? Like network research, if there are folks who've been around as long as I have, like network research used to have sort of, you know, free, not free, but like government supported infrastructure and then it was privatized. And then, you know, people who were doing kind of network research had to sort of rely on companies like Comcast or, or whatever to kind of get data and get access to sort of study, you know, measurement flows. Like that's, that's part of my background, right? In AI, it's it's kind of similar, right? It's you know there is you you have like Amazon or or Microsoft or whoever will like sponsor effectively um, um, like elite computer science programs. So you know you'll have a lot of infrastructure available. You you know might get access to data, um, and then the funding that comes in, right? Like the grants available are to do sort of state of the art, you know, kind of uh, answer kind of state of the art questions that require that type of infrastructure a lot of times. So it's, you know, there's really, there is like, like they've sort of defined pedagogy in a certain way mm -hmm. and they build the tooling and all of the um, kind of the systems that you use when you are doing that work. So you're, you know, familiarizing yourself, not with a kind of like, you know, not, not completely with like a, you know, genealogy of knowledge, but with sort of a corporate infrastructure um, that has been built by these companies and that can be arbitrarily changed or removed or, or what have you by these companies if they want it. So like looking at the, you know, the relationship between Caltech and Amazon is a good one to study in that case, but that, you know, it's, it's across the board, right? All of the, all of the bigs and then all of the smalls are like competing with the bigs to try to get that money as well. <sighs> uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, Lauren, how long uh, should we keep we, we have more time, okay. David. We were great, going great, to at least one thirty. Okay, great. Um, I would like to ask uh, Eileen Blum's question. Um, it speaks to the uh, quote, nothing about us without us, um, which I love. She said, uh, you talked about the effect of new technologies on the disability community and how people with the power people with power don't take into account the actual needs of disabled people. I'm wondering what you think would be a better approach to developing new technologies with disabled needs in mind. 
uh, should we include more disabled people in the process of developing ideas for new tech? And, um, you know, I think it generalizes beyond disabled people, but, you know, should we be including and how can we be including more people into the process of creating tech? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think inclusion is a first step, right? But, you know, how do you, how do you actually ensure that those folks have decision-making power? And how do you ensure that tech that, you know, might be serving a small community, you know, which in the case of disability is extremely important or, or might not be profitable in other ways is also on the table. So I think it's, you know, participatory design can often be kind of a smoke screen that, you know, it doesn't actually allow people to sort of have the power to like meaningfully shape or reshape um, technologies. But I think, you know, there is, we, we certainly need, if you're, if you're building these technologies, you need to have folks involved with power in shaping how they work. Um, but the barriers to that are often that, you know, those technologies that serve a small community just aren't profitable or, you know, um, yeah, just aren't, aren't profitable or aren't, um, you know, don't meet the sort of mythologies of scale benchmarks that um, a lot of these companies are, are um, a lot of these companies calibrate to. Thank you. So, um, a, a, a pair of questions from our own internal working group. Um, Anand Suarte from Computer Science at, at 1249 asks, some of the points you raised earlier are problems with the use of statistics in general, eugenics and the early history of stats. Um, AI is more than just weaponized statistics though. How much of the dangers are the choice of what to statisfy, what functionalities to prioritize versus the choice to gather those stats in the first place, choosing what, how to measure? <clears throat> I'll stop with that one just because that question is really a two-parter. Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't, I don't know that I can like stack rank, like, you know, it's this percent of the danger is that like, it's all, I think you have to think about it holistically. And I don't, but I think that, you know, asking those questions and, and I love that this frame sort of like data collection, not as sort of a, you know, Kind of like a natural off gas that we just collect to get a clear representation of reality but like you know clear choices in terms of measurement methodologies in terms of like where we put our gaze in terms of how we um you know think about the you know data meaning or not meaning and that it's you know it's often a, a fabrication or a construction or something that isn't actually sort of commensurate with what we think we're measuring um, and so being extremely attentive to those histories like who funded the data collection you know, why, what was it originally intended to do? You know, what, you know, how has the, the terrain within which that data was collected shifted since it was collected? Like all of those questions are sort of, you know, I think really, you know, deep and meaningful and like need to be answered before we can sort of do anything, you know, with statistics or AI or, or what have you with that data that will, you know, affect human life. Um, I think, you know, it's notable that almost no data set I've encountered has any of that in information encoded in it, right? Like it's just like stuff scraped from Flickr with no labels, right? Like, or, or, or what have you. And I think, you know, in machine learning in particular that you then have the second layer of like, what is the labeling process on this data, uh, which is, you know, that's irreducible. The data has to be labeled to sort of give it that meaning. And that's often done by um, extremely precarious workers in kind of contexts outside of the context where the AI will be used is it's kind of like the, the this is a like you know epistemic dungeon <laughs> where meaning gets made um, and I would look to the work of Lily Arani who's done a lot of work with uh, mechanical Turk workers and um, and who is actually like organized with mechanical Turk workers on on you know some of some of the implications here um, but I hope that I hope that kind of addresses your question but I, I think it's really good and it's something to like I guess just keep answering those asking those questions all the time when you're engaging in this work. And then from Fred Roberts, um, who is actually the uh, founder of Dymax, David's precursor, um, asking, interest in understanding what we are thinking is not new. The field of sentiment analysis was developed to use text analysis to accomplish this. Some people objected 
because they felt it was a way for government to see who was thinking un-American thoughts and so on. That is a field where academics played a large role in its development, not necessarily big tech. What is different now about new ways to understand what we are thinking? Well, I think this is a really good question. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I tried to be really specific in this talk. You know, I, I'm talking about the commercialization and commodification of these technologies and their sort of, you know, scaling to, for sort of use in, you know, core domains and, 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 um, and you know, for, for significant applications, right? Um, but I do think, you know, oftentimes, like, yes, academics played a big role, but I want to know, like, who was funding them? right? Like, what was the motivation behind that? Like, how was that, you know, it, how did we get to the point where we thought we could, like, read people's minds through text? And, like, what is the, what is the bedrock on which that rests? Um, because, yeah, I, like, I'm not sure there's, like, any, you know, what's different is we're seeing, one, these infrastructures of, you know, you know, huge data infrastructures, huge compute infrastructures, and sort of a commercialization of AI as the answer to everything. Right, and that's being used in the, as an excuse to use AI to sort of, you know, means test and, you know, evaluate and judge and make claims about people based on like random detritus and ephemera that doesn't necessarily map to, you know, what's really going on, and and you know is often used as like kind of a a smokescreen to like hide the fact that you know people wanted to implement austerity measures anyway, people wanted to fire people anyway, right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think with sentiment analysis in particular, I'd look to, you know, I'd look to companies like Fama, which is a, a company that sells sentiment analysis to recruiters. And so they scrape, you know, if you're a job applicant, they'll scrape your Twitter and, and what have you. And then they will run it through their, you know, extraordinarily crude sentiment analysis models to see if you're, you know, risky or bad or, you know, reckless. And they make these determinations, you know, you can see some examples of like their, you know, poor limited sentiment analysis model trying to like make meaning out of sarcastic tweets and it's like the word alcohol is used as a joke and then it's like this person you know might have a drinking problem right so it's like i you know sentiment analysis is never going to capture the context and the richness and the variegated argots of language right and so you know again i think you have to like look back like who's training a sentiment analysis to think like alcohol means a problem Right or training a sentiment analysis to think like you know using swear words in one context where that might be you know entirely socially you know supported would sort of make you kind of um, you know a, a a reckless or dangerous person. So like again, there's like that you know the epistemic dungeon um, in this as well um, that I think you know I, I I find sentiment analysis to be like it's like rough at best and the idea that like you know, I don't, I'm speaking to like humanities folks and English majors, right? Like the idea that one word has a fixed meaning in every context across time, or, you know, one phrase would sort of indicate something about somebody is, you know, I think it, it, it rakes, you know, among this sort of like, you know, phys physiognomy adjacent types of um, um, automated judgment systems. <laughs> um, that makes me think of content moderation and, um, mm -hmm. You know, and I guess we can agree that it's it's pretty bad. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, with the volume of content, like it's necessary. So how, how do you weigh between, you know, need, uh, you know, using something that's necessary, but you know, also something that's not perfect. Yeah, I mean, I don't like you have systems that like flag content one way or another, they are deeply imperfect. Again, you know, open up, like how are those systems weighted, right? Like it's, um, I think I think there are still real issues with those systems, but I also wanna, you know, I wanna bring to mind um, Sarah Roberts work on content moderation that shows pretty clearly that most content moderation is done again by like precarious humans in, you know, like, like kind of cleaning up the mess of these platforms, um, and that it's you know not really fully automated in any meaningful sense. And you know we remember 
when was it? it was like right after COVID when Facebook tried to automate content moderation and it was just haywire. It like clearly did not work. So beyond all of these other issues that sort of, you know, I'm bringing up, I think like it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work like, you know, meaning and nuance and like what's a joke and what's not a joke. Like those require kind of culturally specific anchors that can't be automated and that are like wildly variegated among different populations and, you know, change day to day as like new memes crop up. It's just like, I, I don't see a world in which that's possible. Although it's like a really soothing refrain for Zuckerberg to like repeat in Congress. And, you know, since everyone gets like kind of neutralized when you bring up tech because they feel like they don't understand it or like you know they don't want to appear stupid people are like oh okay i guess ai can probably solve that but like i think we have evidence that it certainly can't do it alone and it's certainly extraordinarily limited right now and then we have to ask like is it you know worth the you know trauma and precarity of having like humans have to review that content in um you know often pretty pretty bad working conditions uh, and again look at sarah's Sarah Roberts work on this for, for more. Um, this is a nice pivot to uh, Paul Tulloch's question on the matter of what doesn't work. Um, do you think the quest to monetize large language models like GPT-3 will be successful in the near term or will the bias within the data and algorithms result in substantive harm to racialized and gendered groups in which, which will prevent such wider usage of these new LLM products and services. And I, I would add that uh, just this morning as part of my homework, I was reading an article saying that um, people were now working on how to automate the way of getting the bias out of large language models. So. Um, um, I mean, this is like, I, I would point to the work of, uh, Emily, Timney, Meg, other folks who have sort of deep knowledge here. I don't have a crystal ball, but I will say one of the things that is really hard with the, you know, especially these proprietary technologies is like measuring direct harm, right? Because the, like if you're, you know, if, if you're licensing GPT-3, you know, you may be embedding it in a backend system that's being used to you know, used in ways that those who would be harmed with it don't have visibility into, right? And there's no requirement to make that transparent or legible or to, you know, even assess that harm. Um, and sometimes companies actually have a counter instead of not to assess that harm because plausible deniability is a liability protection, right? So we would need to understand like, where is that being used? And how do we then assess the harm? And how do we, you know, how do we then use that visibility into the harm to sort of you know push against the further encroachment of of you know bias systems. Um, but like all of those seem like dependencies that I don't have answers to, and um, I would point to the work of, of folks who spend a bit more time with those models. Okay, uh, great. I'd like to um, ask uh, on behalf of Jennifer Vilches her question. She said, uh, "Thank you for your wonderful talk, Meredith." What are your thoughts on the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union that includes activities involving AI? This charter is an attempt to, uh, to have articles of ethical AI in the EU. It is meant for the bodies and institutions of the union as well as national authorities um, when they implement EU law. And I guess I'll add like GDPR, right to be forgotten, things that are coming out of Europe. Um, uh, you know, how do you see these things um, in the picture. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's part of the opportunity that this, or like opportunity that this globally scaled tech provides is that, you know, regulation in one locale can have significant impacts globally. And I would point to, you know, all of the work that companies had to do to even understand the data that they were, you know, capturing, that they were creating and storing after, G um, GDPR was implemented, right? Like none of that existed, but you know, still in the US, the company was doing it, you know, at least in, in a number of contexts sort of like across the board um, because you don't, you know, it's really expensive and difficult and in some, some ways impossible to like roll your own for every kind of arbitrary ju jurisdiction. Um, so that's a, that's a huge opportunity. I, like I would also point to the Illinois law, um, the Biometric Information Privacy Act in Illinois, 
which, you know, it's, it's one law in one straight state that, you know, basically has really high penalties and a private right of action for, you know, um, using biometric data of Illinois residents um, without consent. And there's, there's more to it, but like, it's a, you know, it's a law that tech companies are afraid of. And even though it's only Illinois, sort of like sorting out whether a face print you scrape from Facebook or Flickr is of somebody in Illinois or not, isn't really possible. So this was one of the laws that for a long time was sort of kind of stopping tech companies from releasing some of the more invasive forms of facial recognition. And I know, like, I remember hearing that conversation at Google when they were sort of considering it. it's like, well, we're not, do we want to invite that kind of lawsuit? Um, so I think, you know, I think some of the, some of the regulations coming out of Europe are, are really heartening and could have a big impact overall. Um, I do think the question Europe is wrestling with or like that I interpret through the, the policy for I'm involved in is really like, how do we regulate and put guardrails on, you know, particularly US based big tech companies without precluding the opportunity to, to kind of grow our own, right? And so there's this like weird balancing act you'll see in some of these laws where there's like, you know, definitions that are a little bit squiggly or, you know, kind of, it's, it's very clear that this isn't, you know, there's also an economic incentive to be like, okay, we want to catch up, you know, catch up um, in quotes, but like to, you know, to the US and, and to, you know, China in this regard. Um, so we're, we're sort of balancing those two incentives. Uh, and I would look to the work of Amba Kok, who is our, um, who is AI Now's uh, Director of Global Policy, who's done some really good work most recently editing a compendium of um, uh, uh, editing a report on um, biometric regulation globally and looking at where those laws um, sort of work or don't work or, or what's missing um, specifically in terms of, of some of the debates right now around uh, facial recognition and, and how to regulate it. Great, um, wonderful segue to John McGann's question. Um, John is the uh, faculty director of Rux. Your presentation focused on the role of large technology companies, but I would be interested to get your thoughts on the increasing use of AI by various levels of government for both benign and questionable uses. Yeah, well, I think I would, again, I would point to the work here of Rashida Richardson, who's done a huge amount of work on automated decision systems, which are sometimes, you know, AI, and again, AI is a floppy marketing term that is often used mm -hmm. to describe many, many things. But, you know, sometimes they're AI and sometimes it's sort of, you know, a spreadsheet with a bunch of formulas kind of calculating Medicaid benefits, right? So there's, there's a kind of, you know, there's, there's a, a number of different ways in which government is using automated decision systems. And I think, you know, I think some of the work that has been done to try to sort of make these more transparent um, is really, you know, has, 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 has been good. Um, I would also say that a lot of these systems are still licensed from sort of AI startups or vendors, right? And it's, you know, they're still going to be reliant on infrastructure provided by these big tech companies, even if it's maybe not a, you know, they're not directly licensing the system from these big companies. So we still need to look at sort of the path dependencies there. And, you know, particularly when we're asking questions about transparency, like, can we open up the code, right? Can we, you know, can we work on procurement standards that will require sort of, you know, accounting for data, accounting for sort of algorithmic functionality, you know, the ability to audit these systems um, in, a, in a holistic way, um, or are we going to be blocked by, you know, by a, you know, a vendor who is ultimately licensing an Amazon model and Amazon's not actually going to sort of open that up. So we still, I think, need to be attentive to the way in which the, you know, a lot of these systems are dependent on the same big players because those are the infrastructure monopolies uh, in the, in the country. And I think it, it's right to be concerned about these, especially when you're looking at like the, you know, I was just, you know, thinking about the unemployment benefits scandal in, uh, in Michigan, where, um, where, you know, they replaced human auditors who were looking for unemployment benefits fraud with a automated system that incorrectly classified 40,000 people as having fraudulently applied for unemployment benefits. And so that, you know, that ruined lives. People committed suicide, their bankruptcies. But beyond that, it also sort of, 
created a data trail that was almost impossible to erase. So like the, you know, having the scarlet level letter of being a fraudster then was sort of, you know, when, when you went to apply for say, you know, food stamps or WIC benefits, you were prevented, right? So it's it, the way in which this data has sort of a, you know, an extraordinarily long half-life is something we also have to pay attention to in, um, in assessing and evaluating these systems and recognize that like the databases, which often contain like crusty old, you know, government data are as important as the sort of systems we might be applying to, you know, process and, and, and catalog that data. I think we have time for one more question, uh, David. So that will be one for you to choose. Okay, well, um, I wanted to ask, and it goes to like the irony of the internet as both the problem and solution. Uh, Liza Loop at 101 p.m. She said, there's a large body of open educational resource that would permit any member of the public with an internet connection to self-educate about all of this, you know, about computation and AI functions and pitfalls. You know, why aren't people accessing that? Is it, is it access or motivation that keeps normal people from being, quote unquote, from being better informed? I mean, you know, we're all tired. <laughs> Like there's only so much people can do with like the jobs and the duties of care they have. So I think, you know, there's a lot you can learn on the internet, but you can't learn what goes on inside these companies, right? Like even working inside Google, I didn't have access to the cloud contracts to know that Google was, you know, partnering with the Pentagon, right? Like that was basically a whistleblower inside the company who told me and told some other folks about that, who then, you know, did some work to, whistleblow outside of the company so the public would know, right? But there's a lot that we don't know because trade secrecy on the one hand, classification on the other, and the way that, you know, what we do have access to is often marketing claims. Um, it, you know, it means that I think this is, this goes beyond sort of just, you know, simply the duty on the individual to educate themselves so they can engage in this. Like we can certainly take, you know, MOOCs like on AI, we can understand how these sort of like technical, you know, structures function, but that's not going to tell us how they function when they're trained on data collected by, you know, a faulty, you know, you know, pulse oximeter that like doesn't recognize dark skin, <laughs> right? Like there's a lot, this is not something that like we can just sort of, I think, bootstrap knowledge on. And that's again, why it's like, it has to be sort of inherently collaborative and inherently interdisciplinary. And it has to be making demands on the actors that do have this information. Um, because it, it's not simply that we're sort of like naive, it's that, you know, there's structural obscurity that it, it exists at every level and a complexity of sort of domain, you know, the, the, the vastness of the domains into which this technology is being applied, meaning that like, we need people in all of these positions to be able to speak to it. Well, thank you so much, Merida, for um, helping us to navigate those structural obscurities and those complexities, I, I feel smarter already. <laughs> also very inspired by all of the great questions that we got. I apologize to those of you who um, didn't get your question answered. Uh, we, we could have gone on longer, but I think we would have exhausted ourselves. So this talk will be archived. Um, we also look forward to more. Actually, one of the things that Meredith was just talking about um, the, 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 the really tragic uh, way that people can be caught up in what uh, Michelle Gilman calls poverty logarithms that they then can not escape. That will be the subject of one of our presentations for next Friday at 11 a.m. Um, please join me in giving a resounding round of virtual applause um, to Meredith Whitaker, who I just simply cannot thank enough. Thank you all. These questions were great and it's been a pleasure. And I wanna, again, thank the Rutgers team um, for making it happen. But yeah, I am, um, yeah. I hope you all have a, a, a great Friday and a restful weekend. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Meredith. Bye.